Hey, there we go. Server side development and rock and roll. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hi. Oh. Morning, everyone. Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. My turn to talk now. Okay. Time for software. Can you hear me? I'm going to start. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, good uh, afternoon or so. Uh, I'm here to speak about uh, one of the coolest uh, database technologies in the world that uh, my team is happening to de develop. Uh, my name is Dor. Um, I'm co-founder and CEO of ScylaDB. It's also can be pronounced as Scala. It's a name from the Greek mythology. Um, and uh, I'll tell you what happens when uh, NoSQL comes to be native. Uh, one thing to have in mind while you sit, sit and relax because I'm not the one between the food and, uh, and you. Uh, there's another presentation for that. Um, so we're, we've been developing for the last one and a half years uh, a new NoSQL database. It's fully And it can perform up to one million operations per second per single node, while it offers the uh, good high availability properties, uh, the scale out uh, exactly like Cassandra, but with fantastic performance figures. And of course, awesome and predicted, uh, predictable latencies. Um, what you're looking at now is our basically our IP, because uh, I'll be explaining through the talk about how we build that, and uh, I'll, I'll go into deep low-level uh, de design diagrams. But basically, uh, it's the developers who uh, compose the the, the, uh, the code who, who manufacture this. And uh, uh, right from the start, we designed it to be a, an open source project. Uh, we were familiar with uh, a open source development. Uh, we were the team who created the KVM hypervisor before, and we know how open source works well both in terms of community and also in terms of uh, developers. So right from the start, we allowed our staff not to just uh, settle with uh, everyone that can commute to Herzliya, where our center is, but hire developers across the world. And I highly, uh, rec there's a lot of uh, familiar uh, companies here uh, who uh, some, some of them are POCing our staff. And I highly recommend this model. Uh, today we have uh, developers across 12 countries uh, and counting, and this is just works fantastically. So uh, go ahead and try it yourself instead of just uh, go after the, the, the regular user, usual suspects in these types of events. Of course, Israelis are awesome developers, and it's fun, but uh, there are all there are more smart people around the world. Um, so. Uh, why develop a new database? Um, th there's a lot of more da databases beyond this uh, uh, slide, of course. So let, let, let's just see uh, who uses Redis here. Wow, uh, good thing for uh, Redis Labs here. Who uses Cassandra or uh, HBase? Mm -hmm. uh, who uses Mongo? MySQL? I guess th th there are more hands here than databases, so I guess uh, many of you uh, found the database incompatible of, uh, to, to address any type of workload, and thus you find yourself running multiples. Uh, j just to, to, to be sound, who uses Oracle? Nice as well. I was expecting less, actually, but uh, Larry, d d don't see this film. Um, okay, so the problem is with these databases are each of those uh, can address uh, several usages, but not all. So if, if, if you start with uh, SQL, and this is the, the, the actually the, the best language for uh, uh, describing relationship relational data, uh, databases and tables, the problem is uh, is, the, is in the model, it doesn't scale. And today, practically, most businesses need 24 by 7 
with um, multiple uh, data centers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if you'd like to use it, then you'll have to hire your own development team and uh, try to redo what we do or others do with the distributed databases where you need to do the sharding and the resharding. And uh, if there's a split brain, you, you need to uh, coalesce the data afterwards. A lot of pain tied to it. And uh, at the end of the day, if you'll have a single row that uh, will get uh, busy, like the dress to uh, broke the internet, uh, also breaks databases too. Uh, so you'll run into problems. Uh, Mongo is good is nice, but uh, it doesn't scale much. So for limited user cases, that's fine. I have nothing bad to tell about that. And Redis is quite fast, but it, it, it misses out a lot of uh, clustering technique. Uh, it isn't, it's not flexible as Cassandra in terms of uh, full tolerance and redundancy. And mostly, it's not really a database. It's, uh, the definition of Redis in, in the website is a data structure server, because it's not as consistent as you would expect from a re regular databases. So you ended up with Cassandra or some other techniques like HBase or Dynamo. The problem with Cassandra is that uh, uh, some organizations brag that they have thousands of Cassandra nodes or 10,000. Afterwards, when I meet those uh, uh, developers or uh, uh, VP of r and they actually say, we used to brag about this, but, but it's a pain. It's a pain to manage because it's, and it's costly. Uh, and the problem is that the single node per performance of Cassandra aren't that good. And not only that you suffer in terms of throughput, uh, there's no consistent latency because of Java. And um, uh, sometimes the node is choked with performance, so you can't just serve requests and in parallel maintain your cluster and uh, scale out or do some uh, administrative operations like uh, compaction and repair. S some organizations don't do repairs at all because of limitation of their database. Uh, so that's what we're trying to uh, solve with uh, SILADB. And in one sentence, uh, you, you can think about it is, it gives you the power of Cassandra with the speed of Redis. Um, so before we dive into performance, and I have a lot about to speak about performance, let's, for those who may not be super familiar with Cassandra, I'll, I'll just speak about the good properties of Cassandra, uh, unlike some others. So th the nice thing is you get scale out, high availability, redundancy out of the box. Uh, there's a ring that composes your cluster. All of the nodes are completely identical. There, there are no roles. Uh, each of them uh, is a sort of a load balancer, and clients uh, are smart. So the, the clients uh, know how to reach the right shard among the cluster, and not only the right shard that has the token, the range that uh, the client needs, but also the fastest one. So clients are super smart, and uh, it works active-active. So if you have multiple data centers, then uh, they can all access the local data centers, and those uh, data centers sync asynchronously in the background. Uh, when, when a client reaches a node, then the node becomes the coordinator for this query, and uh, it will uh, um, multicast the, the request to a selected uh, subset of replicas, and when it has the, the right consistency level, it can be uh, all of the replicas, it can be quorum, it can be any type of subset, then the request will propagate back to the client. Uh, everything happened asynchronously, really, really cool model. Uh, not only that it's cool, uh, it, it's, it's a really good uh, database because it's rich. It's not only offers you key value, uh, it offers wide rows, it offers maps, lists, uh, indexes, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a lot of good things about it. And it also plays well with the ecosystems and tools like Spark run on top of it so you can uh, match that with your analytics. So uh, pr all of these properties exist in Cassandra and since we're fully compatible in a, in a drop and replacement solution, all exist in Scylla. So we, we have uh, gossip, of course, is the protocol behind this uh, cluster setup, uh, and things just works really, really nice. Uh, we play with uh, 50-node 50, 50 clusters, 
but it's not limited and you can go up to even 1,000. Uh, with our performance, then I guess even Google may not be needing uh, 1,000 nodes. So let, let's uh, switch to performance. Uh, this graph is about uh, YCSB testing, and we compare a cluster of uh, just three SIL machines running on Rackspace versus uh, several other clusters of Cassandra with uh, different sizes, and we try to hit it with, uh, uh, with requests. So th th this table has 10 fields. Uh, each row is uh, 1K in size. Um, and uh, here is the uh, number of uh, throughput. It goes up to uh, 600,000 ops operations per second. And the uh, vertical bars is the actual number that the database managed to hit. Um, so Scylla is uh, in the uh, light blue. So it can go up to almost 600,000 uh, requests per second for this particular table, uh, just with th three physical nodes. Um, and initially we started with uh, Cassandra with the matching similar three nodes optimized for these tasks. And th those three nodes manages to hit around 120,000 or so operations per second. So l later on we increased the cluster size to nine nodes, repeated that, and with 15 nodes, and even 50 nodes uh, reach around 300,000 ops with Cassandra. So uh, you pay five times more and get half the performance that we get. Um, now, sometimes latency is even more important than throughput. So th this is the same setup, uh, but we, we show uh, average latency here for the reads. Uh, again, YCSB standard stuff. Uh, the blue dots are the latencies that uh, Scylla has a per workload. So let's say if I'm speaking about uh, 400,000. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I skipped. Ah, it told me that the distance is when you have scale problems, then I you're limited. So um, um, and the uh, blue dots are uh, the SILA performance. So let, let's say if you just need uh, 200,000 ops, then the latency is around 400 microsecond with SILA. Uh, similar thing with uh, a Cassandra, then it's tougher because uh, the orange dots are three, three uh, nodes of Cassandra. So it doesn't go beyond 120 uh, ops. Uh, if you if you have larger Cassandra cluster, then uh, they can perform as much, but latency won't be as good. Uh, but who's interested in uh, average latency anyhow? Uh, the real story is the 95 percentile or 99 percentile. Uh, and here is the picture for the 99 percentile, where we basically can do sub five milliseconds even in our edge where we, we go up to 100% utilization. And the, the other uh, Cassandra clusters can't give up. Uh, they do around uh, 15 or 20, 25 millisecond for the 99 percentile for these workloads. And th they stop somewhere there. So if you're interested in performance, uh, then do your calculation. Uh, the nice thing about it, uh, is not only just the performance, but also the labor time that you invest when you uh, run your database. Uh, usually it's, it's a black magic to uh, tune a database. It's, it's really hard, and usually most databases just throw on you gazillion of knobs. Uh, with Cassandra it's even uh, harder because it's, it uses Java, so you have to tune Java and deal with uh, garbage collection. Uh, we take a different approach and w we do everything for you. So b basically, there's not, there's not, it's boring. There's not much time, m much things to do because we try to do er everything for you. For example, we have an IO Tune service which runs on each server the first time and calculates the disk performance and uh, automatically plots the configuration for us. So we'll know not to load the system too much and also to propag propagate back pressure if your disk is too slow. Um, 
So we, we care about not just performance, but uh, operational time for you because it's just impossible to configure uh, databases. And if you, even if you manage to configure it correctly, then uh, if your load changes or your hardware changes, then you need, you need to reconfigure it. Um, for those who are familiar with Cassandra, we're really a true drop-in replacement. We're compatible in the uh, network protocol, the CQL, the disk format, the, the, that's the SS table. Uh, really interesting structure, but I won't get into it. And also the operational side, uh, we have a REST API that uh, we wrote in order to manage it, but in order to make it a true drop-in replacement, we added a, a JMX proxy so you won't uh, need to learn anything while dealing with Scylla. Uh, all of the regular uh, commands from Cassandra just works on this cluster. Um, so not everyone needs one million transactions per second, uh, but it opens up uh, a window to more opportunity. Uh, first, uh, you can just do more with your database. You can. Uh, save more data and query it much more, so uh, the results will be more accurate, run more an analytics. You can shrink down your cluster side. You can cope with uh, sudden spike better. Uh, the nice thing about it is that uh, you, you can really utilize the rich model of Cassandra and not just use it as a key value as, and put blobs into it, but uh, do use the sophisticated uh, operations that are in Cassandra and Scylla uh, because you have excess capacity. And um, one important aspect that, that I, I have to mention is stop putting caches in front of your database. Really, databases need to have their own cache and need to be smart about it. If you have uh, an extra cache in front of the, of the database, then you pay for the, the extra uh, uh, capacity. And also, uh, <coughs> it's a nightmare. <coughs> to sync the two. So stop putting cache. Uh, the database can be as fast as the cache, sometimes faster than that. Um, who's interested how we've done it? <laughs> lucky, I'm lucky. Uh, so um, w w in order to come up with a 10x performance advantage, and it's 10x, the graph I've shown before, uh, the, the three nodes of Scylla compete with 30 uh, Cassandra nodes. Um, we had to do a really radical design choices in order to, to reach to, to these numbers. Um, so first, uh, we do sharding like everyone do, but we, we, we do an, another level of sharding, which is internal. The, uh, you as a, an administrator don't deal with it, but we have shard per core, and I, I'll soon explain uh, why we use that. And we use the latest version of C++, which is scary on one hand. O on the other hand, that's, uh, that's where performance comes from. Uh, we, we have our own caches, and basically we, we try to use any tricks uh, in the book that uh, we know from our uh, virtualization days. So let, let's start with uh, shards per core. So basically, uh, Cassandra, but uh, basically any other application looks like this, a multi-threaded application where you have multiple threads uh, competing with resources that the kernel manages. Um, and the, in, in the multi-core er uh, era, the problem is that there are many, many cores, lots of memories scattered between s several sockets uh, and other sophisticated mechanisms, but the, the problem is as, as much as the kernel is smart, then it's, it's not really connected with the application. And those threads may receive uh, data that was processed by the kernel TCP IP stack on core number 10, and the thread may run on core number 20. And boom, you get cache contention and uh, the, the cache line bouncing and a lot of issues that uh, many, maybe uh, you as, uh, as a Java programmer may never know about, but uh, these things make uh, uh, the code run twice as slow and sometimes even much slower. Uh, we, on the other hand, have shard per core notion. Basically, uh, we run multiple engines. Uh, it's just one process with multiple threads, but each thread is mapped to a single core and it's bound to that core. 
also memory is reserved, so we split the RAM uh, into each shard. So uh, the core and the RAM go together, it's NUMA friendly. And it's highly important, again, that, that's another 2x factor to expect. So b basically it's locked down and these shards have their own data. So if a shard g gets a request, it is the one that handles the request from uh, a zero to 100. It, it handles the entire path. It doesn't need to uh, own locks. And locking in modern uh, computers is very, very expensive. So you get uh, zero locks. Uh, usually you get even zero copy, a lot of good things. Uh, many of you that may s see the TCP IP here uh, will be puzzled about it. So uh, initially when we developed uh, the engine that runs Scylla, then we tested it, uh, we implemented uh, memcache and also a simple HTTP server on top of it. And we observed that with the shard per core notion, then 90% of the CPU goes to the kernel and just gets wastes because of the very same issue that uh, Cassandra suffers from. Uh, so we decided to uh, develop our own TCP IP stack uh, that uh, adheres the same shard per core notion. And boom, uh, performance got twice as good with uh, memcache and, uh, and the web server. And we have this open source project that you can just download and run for yourself. Uh, with Scylla, we haven't even uh, finished to integrate the TCP IP stack and we just use the regular Linux stack today because performance is that good that uh, uh, w why invest there? We should invest in the past uh, uh, six months since beta, then we were just invest investing in stabilizing the code and uh, I'm happy to say that uh, uh, by the end of uh, this month, in 10 days from now, uh, we, we will be receiving, releasing our GA release of that code, but without the TCP IP stack, which remains, uh, it, it works, but uh, at the moment we don't need it. Uh, so expect even better performance in the future. NUMA is a, a non-unified memory architecture. Uh, it, it means that uh, each, each CPU socket has its own memory, and to access the, the remote socket memory, it's uh, twice as expensive. Uh, we also have a, our own scheduler, which schedule tiny tasks within regular threads. It's an entirely user space thing, and it's really, really helpful. Uh, we, we schedule asynchronous tasks. Uh, each core can handle one million tiny tasks of these, and it helps for the asynchronous nature. Uh, the, the example here is w w it comes into play when we speak about uh, caching and block caching. Uh, Cassandra and many other projects utilize the Linux page cache, which is good generic cache for disk accesses. But the problem is that it it's gets hairy because um, um, in order to reach the disk, then Cassandra needs to have its own uh, key cache and uh, row cache. And afterwards, uh, it, the data is in the Linux page cache. So when Cassandra tries to access uh, uh, data, for instance, uh, first the data is cached in 4K granularity by the operating system, but sometimes you may need to just access one a 100 byte object. So it's 40 times waste if you do it with Linux, in, in opposed to do it with our own caching mechanism. Uh, Another thing is that if the data isn't in the cache, then Cassandra as an application isn't in any other application that uses uh, the Linux page cache, uh, isn't aware that it's not there. So it just, the thread accesses the data, the, the memory mapped file, and it's not there. So the kernel goes, to, receives the page fault and goes to bring the data from the disk. But the disk is at least 1,000 times slower than memory. And the, the whole thread stalls, and you need to do a contest switch in order to run some other threads. And this is a nightmare. It's really, really bad for performance. Uh, what we do when we have our own cache is we're aware that the data isn't in the cache. And uh, we issue an asynchronous I.O. in order to retrieve the data and immediately go to schedule the next tiny task with our own scheduler. So we, we can immediately. Uh, be free and the CPU is free to handle uh, some other requests. And these, the, I think that the, ma the main 
uh, building blocks be behind uh, and the magic behind the speed of Seva. Yeah. Um, basically, the, the page table overhead isn't that uh, massive in, in terms of uh, the, the operating system. It, it's, it's structured and it, it's, it's relatively okay. Uh, it's, uh, I would say it's a good question if you're familiar with uh, huge pages that, that weights two megabytes, but uh, the, the Linux page cache doesn't use them. Then they solve some of it, but it, it's not quite of, uh, a, a, a big of a pain, uh, I'd say. so. Uh, th th there's some other pains tied to it, uh, enough pains beside that. Um, mm -hmm. I think I, Google has a re render, had a rendering issue when it's, uh, luckily I have another copy. Apologize for that. Uh, I rendered it to PDF, but uh, <coughs> got lost. Um, for those who are familiar with uh, uh, repair processes, re repair is a process that uh, uh, you synchronize uh, different char different nodes um, across the cluster. So uh, usually it's quite a pain painful operation because uh, there's a lot of data that needs to be exchanged between the nodes sometimes. Uh, 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 hundreds of gigabytes or terabytes per each node, and it can be across your own cluster. So it's it's really challenging job for database and also for uh, you as a, an administrator. So the nice thing about Scylla is we have our own I/O scheduler, and the, the scheduler has different priority classes. So th there are priority classes for repair, there are priority classes for compactions for uh, streaming, for updating uh, new nodes, and also for, of course, regular processing. And with, with this I.O. scheduler of ours, uh, we know how to uh, uh, provide the right SLA per operation. So uh, while uh, this is uh, a screen capture of Cassandra's REST operation, then you can observe that in the yellow that uh, the, the latency and the throughput didn't uh, suffer from much from uh, a repair operation that happened while you serve uh, requests. Um, so b basically, I'm, I'm about to finish. So um, let's speak about where we are and what's next. So um, it, this is a more, it's not for end users, but uh, if you're interested in performance and uh, you're capable of taking the engine below uh, Scylla, and you can utilize, as, utilize it for your own purposes, and we have great plans for it, because uh, it, it gives you gossip today, it gives you fantastic I.O. performance, uh, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, CPU power. So you can take that and deploy it for other areas and implement other protocols. Uh, some maybe just take it for the uh, database client and make the client uh, as fast as the da database because uh, latency can come from the client slowness and some may take it to implement some other tools let, let's say a faster and uh, a, and better kafka because you get all of the goodies of hi the highly available 
properties along with the great performance. Um, and uh, we as a company, uh, we're trying to build the community, so it, this is entirely open source. You, you can go and download the code today and, and run it. We have Docker images, and it works on any Linux uh, distribution. Um, so we have our own uh, community that uh, we're growing. Uh, there are, you can expect a lot of core database improvements, uh, especially in terms of uh, multi-tenancy. Uh, we can utilize the, uh, the I.O. scheduler and to host multiple tenants, so you won't be needing to have uh, 30 database clusters within your organization, but have just one gigantic cluster with a lot of tiny tenants, which is trivial to uh, manage the, those, and will give you really uh, good SLA properties to, to is isolate those tenants. So real-time analy analytics can coexist. And we have plans to uh, improve our Spark integrations. So today, Spark just works. There's a CQL connector. But uh, we can uh, take the computation from Spark and do it on the database, run some user-defined functions over there, and it, 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 you'll gain another order of magnitude improvement. And there are horizontal improvements in terms of uh, taking the engine and deploying it on some other a solution, either the client side or some other uh, architectures. And pretty much uh, that's it. I really urge you to uh, uh, kick the wheels and uh, download the code and try it out. And I'll, I'll be around if you need me. Uh, my, my email address is door uh, at uh, siladb.com. And thank you very much.